Good afternoon to people in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Sydney. And good morning to people in London, Paris, and Milan. Welcome to Finance Mandarin's Reading Club. I am Tara from Finance Mandarin. Firstly, I thank you all for joining us from different parts of the world. In this episode of the Finance Mandarin Reading Club, we're going to dive into the book named Grandpa's Fortune Fables by Mr. Will Rainey. Today, we're honored to have Mr. Rainey share with us some insights into this book. In this book, he provides great tips for teaching your children about money management with various delightful stories. He emphasizes the importance of teaching your children about money from an early age. If you have kids that are between 7 to 13 years old, this is a great book for you and your kids to read together. First of all, please allow me to introduce you to our host today, Vian Lee, the CEO of Finance Mandarin. Vian has over 20 years of experience coaching CEOs, investment professionals, and lawyers from the buy side to sell side of the capital market. Let's welcome Vian to say hi to us. Good morning and good afternoon for all our students, alumni, and friends to join our live event. Thanks, Tara, to did an excellent uh, job and also our live event team. We have limited resources, but we can produce big impact and for the live event. So welcome, Will, again. We're going to bring a lot of insight for you. So, Will, come back to you. Hello. Uh, thank, thank you, Rian. Of course, today we are very honored to have invited Mr. Will Rainey, the author of this book. Mr. Rainey is a writer and speaker focused on helping parents teach their kids about money. His work had appeared in the Financial Times, iNews, and the National News. He has also spoken at Fortune 500 global companies. His website, bluetreesavings.com, has helped thousands of parents educate their kids about money. Before starting Blue Tree, he has he was an award-winning investment consultant, advising some of the world's largest financial institutions on their long-term investment strategies. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Rainey to the stage. Hi, Will. Um, I think we're going to ask you some questions immediately. As uh, lots of people in podcasts and that you have joined already, they will ask you, what are the motivation to write a book? And I came to you because I understand that you you were and you are the expert in uh, advising pension funds, insurance company, and big institution how to structure and strategy for, for the big uh, finance portfolio. Now you become the author <laughs> and writing the book, Teaching Money for Kids. So tell us what are the motivations behind it? Sure. No, thank you, first of all, for having me uh, on this book club and my book. So the background was in around 2017, I was in Hong Kong and I was talking to someone about my two young daughters and they said something very obvious, but they said, oh, enjoy this time with them. They only grow up once. And it's a very obvious statement, but it had a really big impact on me. And so my wife and I wanted to make sure that we could spend as much quality time with our young children uh, whilst they were young. So we decided in 2019 to, to leave our full-time corporate jobs and move to, to Vietnam, which I'm talking to you from today, and to have this a, a time to do that. But whilst as I was leaving uh, Hong Kong, a lot of my uh, peers and colleagues and clients, etc., some of them asked me, how can we afford to do what we're doing? And it kind of struck me that we're in the kind of minority who have been kind of saving and investing for the longest time to have this kind of financial freedom, to have this opportunity with our kids. And so I was really adamant that I was, whilst we're here and spending this time with my kids, I wanted to make sure that they understood money so that when they're older, they can have this opportunity to have this freedom to spend time with their, their families uh, or do whatever they want when they're older. And so whenever I was putting my kids to bed, I was going to teach them a different topic, mm -hmm. uh, money. So whether that's about saving, budgeting, uh, earning and investing um, whilst they were kind of growing up and they really enjoyed it and they were cutting on to all the different uh, elements but to make sure it was fun I kind of used uh, uh, stories and analogies mm. and I started to write these down and then share them with firstly with friends and family and I got a really good response and so I started my my blog which is on my website and so every week I committed myself to teaching my children a new topic and then writing an article about that and over time I had a number of these little stories within uh, the articles and the blogs uh, that someone kind of suggested, why don't you put this into a book? 
And so just over a year ago now, I put all of those little stories into a book, which is now uh, Grandpa's Fortune Fables, with the aim of trying to help as many families start to talk mm -hmm. about money, given that money, sadly, is not taught in many schools, but it's so, so important that kids learn about money. So, wow. yeah, that's my motivation. Great. I also have your book. <laughs> we bought it uh, from uh, Amazon. And then since I got the book like two months ago, and uh, I also share with lots of students. And again, I want to thank you. If you just arrived today, we have uh, more than 140 participants to join the event today. And they are all our students. I can see a few here and say hi to you. And I, in the classes, we're talking about asset management, asset allocation, and wealth and reach. And then now, if we are doing well, well, why don't we do it earlier and teach your kids about what's money? So this is a great book. If you like, I suggest you buy a book. But now we're going to hear more about what is a great insight in the book here. So now let's move on, Will. This is one of the blog that you very popular, get a lot of feedback. So share with us and how is it related to teaching kids about money? Yeah. So, so yeah, so I wrote this book about, well, I released it about two weeks ago now. And the reason is I want my children to kind of grow up knowing the kind of trends that are going on at different points in time. So they, A, just knowledge about these trends that kind of potentially come and potentially go, may not go. So what I did is, and I knew a lot of parents are probably hearing about NFTs as well, but don't really know what they are and if they hear about people making money from them. Uh, so I wanted to have a blog that was both useful for the parents, but also uh, the children. So in this blog, I wrote a little story about Timmy, who was an artist. So he had a painting that he painted and it, he loved it and it got everyone else loved it. And so he sold it uh, to an art collector and he kind of learned about how selling normal art works. And then he got some money and he bought a tablet and he started to do art on his tablet and he wanted to sell that. But at the time, there was no way of doing that until we came across this piece of about an NFT. And so it was helping him that everyone kind of understand Timmy's little journey and what an NFT is from mm -hmm. a purely practical point of view. So NFT, non-fungible token, is a way for selling digital art or digital products uh, and making sure everyone knows that it's the original version of that. Because people, just not me, but other people really like just having the original of something <laughs> and they'll pay yeah. a lot of money, even if it's not, uh, it's exactly the same as the copies. But right. at the same time, I really want to stress the other piece around it being an investment. And again, I've talked to my daughters about investing in the stock market. I've talked to them about cryptocurrency and I wanted to talk to them about this and making sure that they realize that some people are buying it just purely for investment, but the only way they can make money is if they can find someone who will buy it at a higher price and that they don't produce any income. So that means they have to find what's called the greater fool. And I always bit, make sure that my children and all children are a bit skeptical about playing what's called the greater fool theorem, where you can only make money if you find someone who can pay higher, because at some point there's going to be someone who's not going to, willing to pay any higher, and then you're going to end up being the greater fool. And so I want my children to understand this dynamic. Again, they might still decide to do it, but I want them to go into the world of investing uh, with open eyes uh, and understanding and, and see that sometimes these sort of trends uh, may not last forever. And not, that's not to say I've got a strong view that NFTs aren't going to last forever and become a fantastic investment. I just want my children to be kind of cautious on that and see where the money is coming from and where it's going. And also some of the other downsides uh, in terms of the environmental mm -hmm. uh, scams as well because uh, again mm. I want children to be open so yes yeah, so I wanted to have this topic and yes it is one of my most popular blogs lots of parents saying they found it super useful for their own knowledge because I say most the financial literacy age of many adults is actually quite young mm -hmm. for having these this kind of uh, articles which are kind of written in a way that you can teach your children it makes it easy for parents and children alike yeah it's actually a great approach. The NFT concept even is hard for adults, even for it's hard and unpredictable and for some professional portfolio managers, right? We are all learning. So the learn, learning starting early, the better, as you say, just like learning money. It's a great story about that, yeah. And also from your book here, you mentioned about this as well. Explain it to us. Sure. So in my book, I have what's called the three rules of wealth, and they're yeah. very simple so um the first one is, is spend less than you earn 
Mm. Second, invest what you save. And the third is be patient. And all three of these are, when written down, very, very simple. But yet very few people are following these three rules in mm. terms of adults in many of the Western world. Actually, sadly, only around uh, a third of people actually follow those three rules. Most are in debt or, or not investing and saving. But it's the third one that is be patient. And so in my analogy that I use in the book and in lots of my blogs, it's about you need to try and grow this kind of financial forest. So first of all, you need to have some seeds, then you need to plant them. And then the third yeah. one, you have to let them grow. Trees take time to grow. And that's the same with money. And it's all about being patient. Yeah. And I see patience as the superpower of the wealthy. <laughs> uh, those who aren't patient are less like are more likely to to gamble are more likely to use debt because they don't want to why should i have to wait to buy something i can just use debt and they're yeah. a lot more to get scammed as well so the, the whole get rich quick schemes are, are there for people uh susceptible who just aren't patient they they can't wait for their trees to grow they need it now yeah. but so when it comes to investing and compound interest people who have been investing for a long time and seeing compound interest work are, are just so happy they've done that because they've been patient. But compound interest takes a while to get started. And so I want, in the book, I talk about these stories of these characters who aren't patient and kind of lose out. Um, and so I want my children to be patient and I get them to practice being patient uh, as well. So and that's one of the hardest tasks. You have to be patient as a parent to help your, your children be patient. But if they do, it's gonna pay dividends literally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the future, I resonate for your 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 point very much. You know, even for our adult students, whether they are like investor relations, portfolio managers, or marketing communication managers, they need to teach the common people what is saving, <laughs> avoid the debt, avoid some scamming, especially finance regulators. Now there are lots of education programs to teach adults. So now if we put the financial education, starting from the younger, starting with the parent to teach them, that'd be a wonderful idea, especially not only in US and uh, foreign country, perhaps even in China, in Asia as well. So that's a re really a good starting point. Yeah. So how to cultivate children's concept of money then? Oh. So John, I saw that you have questions. <laughs> Sudden question. Uh, open your microphone before you start, please. I have, a, I have a question about uh, the cryptocurrencies. Um, I, I can imagine it um, wasn't easy to explain to a, a young child, like a five-year-old, what's a cryptocurrency. But I can imagine it's a similar issue talking to adults. You know, cryptocurrency is quite a new thing. And if you're talking to, you know, a, a regulator in China who's been in the finance industry for 30 years, cryptocurrency is probably quite a new thing. Not just China, America, Australia, Europe, all that kind. So uh, here's a bit of a challenge for you, Will. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Can you explain cryptocurrencies to me as if I'm a five-year-old? <laughs> how, <laughs> how to make it, how to simplify the concept? Sure. So uh, cryptocurrency in its most purest form is to say instead of ha I always start with the real what's happened before before starting with the new. So when we're paying for things, we're essentially giving over some some bank notes or coins. And this and that's how we pay for things. But in the new world, people want to be able to have money, which is on the Internet and kind of very, very secure. So they want to be able to take their money from one place to another. And therefore, what they can do is do this using what's known as, as uh, cryptocurrency and, and Bitcoin is, is one of those pieces. And what that's doing there is you have to go, instead of going finding gold, which was how countries used to have money and trade, people now go and f try and break these incredibly hard pieces of code. <laughs> and once they do that, they get what's known as a, a cryptocurrency or a coin. We'll use a Bitcoin as an example. And so you can go and buy these Bitcoins and that means you own them. And if you want to go and have something else from uh, buy something with that, you can hand over your cryptocurrency just like um, spending money. But the difference is it's all logged on a computer. So you don't actually get to touch or feel this money. It's all on a computer. So someone's yeah. keeping track on what's known as the blockchain. And it's super secure. So everyone knows what transaction has happened. Uh, could, I, could I just uh, point out, 
someone's keeping track of that. In fact, with cryptocurrency, did I understand correctly? It's the built into the structure of a cryptocurrency is everybody's keeping track of that, yes. not someone. Yes, no, you're right. Uh, yeah, no, so it's all on there so everyone can see exactly where they're. And that gives it that security. So people in, like the cryptocurrency in the sense of it has that security. It's not one person kind of looking over it or one regulator or government country. Uh, yeah. It's kind of the money for the people is how they've kind of sold uh, the concept of that. And that's why. And people... hence, some of the central banks are a little bit. Exactly. Ca cautious or thinking carefully how to make use of cryptocurrency. Mm. Exactly. And so people are seeing this as a new technology. So from a technology point of view, um, again, my personal view uh, is that the technology is fantastic. And I think in the future, there'll be some way that we'll all be using it. But then it comes mm. down to the, the value of it. How much is a Bitcoin worth? And that yeah. comes down to um, what people are willing to buy and sell it for. And as I mentioned in the NFT piece, it comes down to what's known as the greater fall theorem in the sense of if I have one, I can then go, I have to find someone who's willing to pay more for it than I bought it to make any money out of it. Because at the moment, people aren't generally using it to buy things, not like normal currency. So you can buy something. Most people are getting uh, cryptocurrency for speculating and to try and make more money. And that means... What's it actually worth? And if I'm going to go and pay, and if I buy something, it's going to be very volatile. So I say to my children, the technology is fantastic, but at the moment, as lots of people are speculating on it, and plus also because it's not regulated, there are potentially lots of people who are, are trying to use it in, in kind of bad ways to make money for themselves. And also the environmental impact, because those computers that create the codes take up a lot and a lot of energy. Now that might change in the future and regulations might stop the, the people who are doing the scams and trying to exploit. And hopefully people will be using it as a currency. But this time at the moment, this digital currency is quite new. It's very, very hard to say what the fair value will be and that will come over time. So yeah. I want children to know what it is. So it's this digital currency that is, is secure, but at the moment it has some uh, risks associated both financially and otherwise. Um, and that's why I want them to be aware of uh, as they kind of grow up. Okay. Thank you uh, for John's question, John. <laughs> okay. Do you pay because your I... kids in Bitcoin, mm. their pocket money? Yeah. Well, again, would, would the kids accept Bitcoin as pocket money? Um... Mm. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, John's question. Because I know this kind of question for some creative kids, kids now, they're very clever. You never expected what kind of question that we ask you. Even, you know, a lot in China, because we use like WeChat Pay, Alipay. So kids didn't have the concept of money. They think, where's your money? Just from your phone. They don't know how difficult parents to do work, hard work and save money. So they can buy anything they want. So they think money is from the iPhone or just from the phone. So the concept of money. So thank you, John. I know a lot of parents will have this kind of question. They ask me a lot of things about money and how can I explain to them? I think Will's book, we have a lot of story to explain and the blog can step, step by step to introduce. And even if we want to know more, and we have a website, Uchi, have the videos, 20 minutes, five videos. You can learn more from that as well. So let's come back here a little bit. The concept pocket money, do you also explain for that? And is that how essential is that talking about pocket money? Yeah, so pocket money, I think, is one of the most underrated um, financial education tools there is. Um, because when it comes down to um, money and, and how good we are, it's not about just knowledge. It's about actions. So it's all about right. every time I get some money, do I save some? And if I do, and do I follow those three rules of wealth I mentioned earlier? So pocket money allows kids to start forming good habits. And it's those habits that are ultimately going to determine their financial future. So I always say to parents, if you can give your children, afford to give your children any kind of a little bit of money every week to make some financial decisions, that's going to help them um, learn, make mistakes. It's going to help them budget. It's going to help them save up for the things that they want versus kind of need. But if you can then input into that to say, right, every time they get some money, get them to save just a little bit. Yeah. And then they can start forming this savings habit. So when they're older and have more money themselves, they'll start saving because that's just what they do because <laughs> they've been doing it all their lives. Yeah. Whereas 
if they only get it at kind of very random points in time, they get overexcited about money and they want to go and spend it all and because spending is fun. Whereas if they get it regularly, it's A, not so exciting, but they're therefore more happy to save some. Uh, and again, it's all about getting them into that habit. So I reckon pocket money, if you can afford to do so, I recommend all parents uh, give them some. Mm, okay, so this is in Asia culture is another new concept. Because before the parent taking care, especially the housewife didn't work and take care of everything, buying all the stationery, food and drinks and uh, food and clothes. So the kid didn't have any pocket money. But since like mom had to go out to work, so they starting to give some money for the kids buying the necessity like food and traveling. Yeah. And then they just only know how to spend. But sometimes they save all the pocket money to buy something they want to buy and then didn't eat and didn't take the traveling. <laughs> so there's another way how to allocate your pocket money and also how much to pay is one, right? And then also it's like, are you going to give them some instruction how to allocate the money and save some part? So this is also in Asia, there's a big issue and big uh, gap. How can we educate our kids to do that? Because even for the adult, they didn't learn about investment. The basic thing about stock or asset or fund, they don't know. So everybody is just like specific speculation in Asia, <laughs> buy or loss, right? So everything starting from the young, especially our students nowadays, they're all the finance uh, professionals. They know the finance important. So they're really eager to know how can we educate our kids to do more? So what would be your tips for them, Will? Yeah, so the, the two big ones are, if you're talking to young children, get them to think of money like seeds, as I mentioned earlier. It just mm. makes it so much more engaging for children and they can visualize it. So it's not this arbitrary numbers. Um, they're thinking of these money like seeds, they give those away like spending, but then they can start going, well, what does it mean when I plant it? When they're very young, it's just a nice concept. But as they get older, they'll start questioning. So when my daughters were like four years old, I used the, the money as seeds concept. And now they're older, they're, they're more like, we talk about investing and those trees growing. Okay, that means that we, some of the money that we, we invest every month for them goes to companies. And so yeah. when we're McDonald's in Hong Kong a couple of years ago, we said, you own a piece of this McDonald's. And they got so excited. And yeah. then we went, the Apple store and said, yeah, you own a piece of this and all the money those people are buying for the iPads and iPhones, some of that's yours. And so even from a young age, they were kind of grasping that they can be a, an owner, not just a consumer. And now my oldest, who's nine, is asking about dividends and et cetera. And she's just getting a bit more curious and because she's using that analogy. She's sort of saying, well, our trees produce these seeds. What are these seeds? Where do they come from? Again, that's all about helping them understand about dividends and that they need to plant those seeds to grow more trees and, and see their, their wealth kind of grow up, grow yeah. over. And so I think that's one. And the second is to, yeah, just try and make it fun and make it about actions as well. I say yeah. it's so much more important that your children take the right actions as opposed to become like financial geniuses. <laughs> um, I say it's, I know lots of people in the financial services industry who have lots of knowledge, but yet still struggling yeah. financially because they're not putting their knowledge into action. And so yeah. the, we can start getting children to take the right actions. You don't yeah. have to kind of rewire that brain <laughs> and that exactly. as you're older. So yeah, exactly. start make it action based and, and use the money as seeds. Concept. Yeah, I totally agree for that. Knowledge is not equal to action. When you have a lot of abundant knowledge, how can you execute and educate your kid you take some action and patient and curriculum design with stories right so i looked at the table of content here because i had your book i have your book i uh, went through that i find it's very interesting only thing i hope is colorful <laughs> <laughs> but you look at the table content here, you mentioned about a lot of things is from your expertise, a 20 years experience advising the big insurance giants and institutions. You can see here talking about risk, test, right? Uh, strategy, asset, charity is all relevant to our students. They know all. <laughs> and how can you tell this kind of uh, concept? become a story and then a young kid can get it and find it interesting. So I think you, you actually did a really good job. <laughs> yeah, so I would like to, uh, you, our student here, listen, and then this is a really good one. You're starting with this one because you know finance well well. 
yes. how can you take action and read the book together? And uh, this is like actually quality time for uh, for uh, all students together, right? So, and also I ask you, because actually in China, the finance education is just a starting point. So before I also ask you, like maybe the planning to have different versions, uh, language versions, and then can get the concept even to more nationalities and different countries. So any plan in China, what are you thinking? Yes, no, I'd love to be able to uh, translate into different countries. Um, I have self-published, so it does mean I'd need some, uh, some Mandarin speakers to help me uh, advertise and market my book <laughs> to, to their networks. But uh, in the future, I, I very much would like to have it in as many different uh, languages as possible, reaching as many families as possible. I say it's such an important topic, uh, sadly not taught in schools, and it's universal. So every single country in the world is, is kind of lacking in terms of the financial literacy um, at the young age. And that has just such an impact on the financial well-being and uh, general well-being of people around the world especially as nations are getting richer and richer um so yeah so the more we can do uh in every single country to, to promote financial literacy at this young age and mm -hmm. cover these topics and i think these topics some of them are are kind of taken from some of the best personal finance books so uh, rich dad poor dad um the richest man in yes. babylon mm -hmm. the next door or the psychology of money these mm -hmm. are books that pretty much everyone who's read them goes i wish i I wish I knew this stuff when I was younger. <laughs> and so I hope the next generation won't have, won't be saying that because they would have hopefully learnt it from, from their parents and, and from this book. Yes, it's an excellent summarize of the book and the essence of the book, you know, finance education. We are also the pioneer to promote the finance education and then conduct a training in, in the Mandarin Chinese. And not only the knowledge, the linguistic, but the China focus as well. So this is like the synergies that we, we have for with a, a wheels book here. So you can see we have the little uh, kiss book and finance menu brochures here. And yeah, so that's very good. I will uh, later on let uh, Tara to run it up for our today's event. But before we go, actually, I would like to thank you for IFEC. They have done a great job and also our students and under SFC. And uh, this is a uh, uh, investor and finance education council. And then they did a great job. And recently, they actually just have another annual reward for those organizations and institutions they contribute for the finance educations. And that's including uh, Economic General, Visa, BOC, HBC, Citibank, and CPL, Sun, Sun Life, Hong Kong VX, and Fidelity. Those are all our students. Thank you very much for contributing to the society, teach the, um, teaching the investor, educate the investor, and consumer, protect the consumer. It's so important. Okay, Tara, hang over to you. Let me run it up. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Mr. Rainey, and the end for your insightful sharing. The book, Grandpa's Fortune Fables, is really an interesting book for children and finance beginners to read. So I shall wrap it up for today. If you target the China capital market, come to Finance Mandarin. We help senior executives to learn firsthand China market knowledge and polish your business Mandarin communication skills. With our advanced AI learning platform, you will be able to access the course content whenever you are. If you are a business professional who wants to maximize your investment in learning, Finance Mandarin is the right place for you. For more course details and tips for learning Mandarin, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Book your trial class now with us. I thank you once again for joining us today, and I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you.